Hello and welcome to my presentation, Remembering the Fallen, Teaching World War II with Local Soldiers. My name is Shane Gower and I'm a teacher at Miranda Cook Community High School in Reedfield, Maine. And on that first image are a couple of memorials actually near my school of uh, soldiers from World War II um, who were killed in the Second World War. So I'm going to talk about um, how I got involved in this work um, and um, kind of what we do as a result of that. It goes back to 2011. Um, we did an exchange trip to France and I brought some students and we visited the Rhone American Cemetery in southern France and the cemetery associate, Alan Libersa, um, she met with us and she challenged us to tell the stories of the main soldiers who are buried in that cemetery. So we ended up going back and for the next group of students who came, we did research on the story of George Arsenal of Rumford, Maine. And here's a quick video clip that explains um, what happened. Weeks after his death, the Arsenault family learned that George was killed in the second invasion of France. He was then buried in the Rhone American Cemetery in Dragonion, France. Nearly 70 years later, a group of students from Maine visited the cemetery as part of an exchange program in April 2011. They were asked by one of the guides to find out more information about the Maine soldiers who were buried there. Social studies teacher Shane Gower was one of three teachers who decided to take on this project with his students at Moranacook High School. So during the summer between her freshman and sophomore year of high school, Sydney Green started to collect research online, trying to discover the story of a soldier from Maine, George Arsenault. She eventually connected with one of George and Leo's nephews. He says, I'm going to give you Sydney's number and you'll have to call her because I don't know any particulars about it. I said, well, uh, we're doing this project for school and um, I was wondering if you're the brother of um, George Arsenal, he said, yeah, so it kind of, and then I just started asking him questions and um, asked him if I was going to be able to um, meet up with him sometime. Sydney and Leo eventually met and Leo told her the story of his brother. Yeah, 70 years and uh, they took the time, they didn't have any clue he was and uh, it still hurts. After Sydney heard Leo's stories and saw George's photos and letters, she and her classmates went back to Rome Cemetery and presented George's story. Thanks to you all, I can now talk about George. I now know that he was just over, over 17 years old when he decided to lie about his age. It was just really, really powerful because um, like, I was finally like there and I was so many miles away from home and so many miles away from where I had done the research and it was just really really amazing because it was so different yet so much so, so similar. Back in Maine, Leo and Sydney reconnected once again, this time at Moranacook High School. Sydney had received a special gift from the cemetery that she presented to Leo as a symbol of this project. It was a picture of his brother's headstone and a French and American flag with dirt on the ends of each of them, so that he'll always have a piece of his brother's gravesite thousands of miles away. And, you know, teenagers with grief taking the time to get out there and do this and pay their respects to somebody, like I said, they didn't know him for nothing. And, uh, you know, it's, it's fine, all fine to me. So. And for Sydney, a kid from Maine, to learn about another kid from Maine who gave his life for his country, it beat any textbook reading about World War II. So since then, each year um, we have followed up with one to two soldiers from Maine and, and tried to tell their stories as well uh, in my classroom. And um, these are so, uh, soldiers who were killed in the Second World War and are buried in one of the American Battle Monuments Commission cemeteries outside the U.S. Um, and we follow a step-by-step -step process um, very similar to what I learned working with National History Day and also the American Battle Monuments Commission. And I have a website there that will take you to um, what they recommend for uh, steps in the process. And you'll see it's very similar to what I've been doing. And these are just really quickly some images of some of the soldiers from Maine, um, some of the stories that we have told over the last few years. And you'll hear a little bit about each one of them in my presentation. And you looked at the primary source documents for Robert T. Waugh um, earlier this morning. And we also use this process as part of that, um, the question formulation technique. So I recommend this book. 
uh, make just one change. You can also go to their website, writequestion.org. And my presentation um, is kind of following up after you hook students with this process and get them engaged, um, what you do after that, okay? Um, and again, um, as we simulated this morning, the idea is to generate curiosity and use inquiry to get students interested and engaged in learning more about um, their silent or fallen hero. These are the two documents that we looked at, the two letters about um, the burial of Robert T. Waugh. And these are some of the questions that students have come up with as a result of doing this activity. And um, these questions are really interesting. And as you can see by reading through, um, they can take you down a bunch of different rabbit holes um, for different areas to explore. Questions around um, why did the US government give families the option? Uh, why didn't they just bring them home? Um, or why did they just not bury them all in Europe? Um, questions about why Helen Waugh and John Waugh, the father and the widow, why they couldn't talk to each other, why they didn't talk to each other, why they didn't agree on what should be done um, with his remains. So it's really interesting, um, you know, you could take this into different ways with students. And this, is a, this serves to hook the students. Um, engagement's very high, curiosity's high. Um, they want to learn more about, in this case, Robert T. Waugh and his journey and kind of what happened to him. And so um, once you've kind of hooked them, you can then start the process of telling that story. And now they have a vested interest in learning more about that and then connecting it to the bigger picture of what was happening in the war, how the war impacted um, our community and um, the country as a whole. And I think what's really important is that Silent Heroes, they connect the students to the community, um, they make it relevant, and it also promotes um, good historical thinking skills. The first step is selection. Um, is it somebody that you know? Is it someone like a student's family member, somebody famous? If not, uh, my recommendation is to go to the abmc.gov website and do a search. Um, you can narrow it down by your state, and then you can find, um, in many cases, many soldiers from your state um, who were killed and are buried in any one of the cemeteries. So if you want to pick a particular cemetery for a particular reason, you can, um, or you can keep it more broad and pick someone. You might even find someone from your city or town, um, and I think that always helps as well, the, the closer you can get. And this is what it looks like when you do the search on the ABMC website. Um, once you've done that, I highly recommend getting their, um, their service files. And there's a process you can go through. I have it here on the slide. You can go back later and check it out. Um, every, every soldier has what's called an OMPF, or at least they had one. About 70% of them were destroyed tragically in a fire in the 1970s in St. Louis, where the, the facility where the files are held. Um, but everyone who was killed does have an IDPF file, and those were not destroyed. Um, if you're lucky, you'll get both. Um, but I always recommend putting in a request for both. Um, even though the OMPF, the likelihood of getting it is smaller. Um, that way, if you get both, um, a lot of good information will be in those uh, files. And you should do that first because it can take several weeks to get the files. Once you've done that, you can go to archives.gov and look around a little bit more because there are more and more all the time digitized records um, on the website. And so you might get lucky and your um, silent hero, the person you've picked, they may have something on the website um, connected to their unit um, or connected to the battles they were in or something like that um, to give you some information. This is a photo I found in the National Archives in College Park of uh, Joseph Rideout of Holton, Maine, um, near the French and German border. The next step in the process is to think about um, their pre-war background. Um, what information about their background is helpful? Um, what was life like before they participated in the war? Um, and what information do local organizations have about them? Historical Society, American Legion, Family, Church, School, etc. And so um, Ancestry.com, most people are familiar with. You may not know there is a free version for classrooms, AncestryK12.com. And you do have to request permission ahead of time. Um, and they set it up. They have to know your IP address. And they will set it up for you. And it's free to use on campus only uh, because it uses the IP address of the school. So you can use it on, on school grounds for free. It will not connect to any family trees. But you can research as much as you want. And of course, the 1940 census is a great place to get information about your silent hero's family. 
One of the things that we have discovered is if you want to try to connect with the family, this is the best way to do it because you can find out maybe they had siblings, the person you've chosen, and those siblings, um, they may have passed away. It's possible they're still alive, uh, but if they passed away, there's a good chance they passed away fairly recently, so they might have an obituary online. Once you learn their name, you could search for their obituary. And then once you find it, you will see listed in the obituary their children, um, and you, those folks are usually still alive. And so this is how we've been able to connect with families. Um, from there, it's a social media search, Facebook or something, or maybe you look up their phone number, um, try to make a connection to the community, and you can get in touch with them. And we have found that they always are, are willing to talk. Um, the person that you connected with may not know anything, but they know in the family who does. And that's the person who becomes a great ally in the research. They may have a bunch of stuff. They probably have a vested interest in learning more. It's important um, once you make the connection with the family to set up the opportunity to have like an interview. And I think it's important, especially if students are doing this work, um, there's a great guide on the National World War II Museum website on conducting oral history interviews uh, to try to ensure that it's um, organized and it's respectful um, and it gives the opportunity for the families to be heard. So I recommend that guide um, for doing that work. And this is my student, Maddie, who interviewed Peg. Um, her brother, Carl Alexander, was killed in the Second World War and is buried in the Normandy uh, Cemetery. And this is the flag um, that her family received uh, after he was killed. And this is Peg again um, with her brother, Carl. Um, and obviously before um, he went off to France during the war. And we have a little video clip coming up here of um, part of the interview that was done with Peg about her brother. My uncle Carl, the one that you're doing the research on, was named after his uncle Carl, Carl Hansen, my grandmother Hansen Alexander's brother. And then my cousin Carl was named after Carl Alexander. So I have a, a cousin, my mom's sister's, um, one of her sons is named Carl. So the name Carl has come down at least through three generations. Mm -hmm. It's a small town. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and please help us. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think Carl taught me how to drive. I'm not sure. Oh, he taught me in the, in the hay, hay field. He wanted somebody to drive the truck so that he could put the hay in the back. So I said, Carl, I can't drive that thing. Yes, you can. All you have to do is put your foot on. So the next step in the process is to think about the U.S. home front, um, and this gives context um, to what the silent hero was doing before the war, um, and this will help us understand um, what was happening, um, you know, nationwide, but also in your community um, during the war. At local historical society, the state archives, the American Legion, the family can all be great resources um, for learning more about that. And there's a great website as well. The archives.gov uh, website has uh, America on the home front um, linked to their website, which gives good information about um, what was happening in general nationwide. Um, but this is a great opportunity to connect more with your community. Here in Maine, um, we had two shipyards that were very active during the Second World War, and there's a lot of history with that. So that would be a great way to connect the local uh, home front um, with what was happening uh, during the war. Um, you can also visit the State Archives, which would have a lot of newspaper stories on the, about the home front during the war, um, or connecting with a local historical society. And one example we did was um, in Lubeck here in Maine, a small town, they have a historical society, and they had a bunch of records on the history of sardines, uh, sardine canning, and actually they were the, um, the sole, their, their company in, in Lubeck was the sole producer of sardines, canned sardines, for the U.S. Army during the war. Um, and they made them in a special square can for um, shipment. And um, we learned about um, Sherman Andrews, and he was killed in a, in a bomber over Germany. And he also worked in a canning factory, and his family did as well um, here in Maine uh, during the war. Military service. Um, this is the next step in the process. Uh, what branch of the military, the unit? Uh, what did your silent hero do in the war? Campaigns, battles, uh, recipient of any awards, Purple Heart, etc.?
And a great resource for this I have found um, is this book, Finding Your Father's War. Um, I, I don't have a specific military background, um, and this book is very helpful. When you get those records and those files, making sense of what they say and what they mean uh, can come from this book because it explains, for example, um, rankings and the, the organization of how the army was organized and the kinds of abbreviations or things that you might see in these files are all available um, for explanation in this book. And um, if you were able to get those files, the IDPF or the OMPF, um, they will be the most valuable resources we have found in this work. Um, and again, you can go back to the archives and you might be able to find more information um, with some of those digitized records that they have on their website. Also, interestingly enough, the Bangor Public Library, which is just an hour away from me here in Maine, um, they have, I think, almost all, um, maybe all, of the history, the unit history books that were made during World War II for each unit that fought in the Second World War. And they have the you know physical copy and they've digitized them all and they're all available for free to download all the ones that they have. I don't know that they have them all, but they have pretty close to them all if they don't have them all. Um, so I have the website here and um, you can download any unit history and again, learn more about what your silent hero was doing uh, in battle during the war in combat. Also, um, obviously, we can't interview the silent hero about he, um, his or her experiences, but um, Rutgers University has a great oral history archive, as does the National World War II Museum. And so people who may be fought in the same unit uh, or in the same battles and the same campaigns, um, they can talk about what it was like. And again, it can, you can kind of make the connection that this is probably similar to what your silent hero uh, would have gone through. So one of the files that came from um, the IDPF for Carl Alexander, the things that he had in his possession um, when he was killed. Sometimes the best information um, on the military um, can still come also from the family. They may have letters, they may have um, stories, things that happened during the war. And again, that same um, guide from the National World War II Museum for conducting oral history interviews would be really good here. Um, one of the things we found was Robert T. Waugh's Medal of Honor citation, um, which you can read through here. This is the quote from his citation, um, and you can see um, it was quite an experience that he went through, um, and he was killed a about a week later. So he was not killed with this action for which he received the Medal of Honor. He was killed about a week later. Um, on, the, on YouTube, there are a series of videos on the Medal of Honor, and one of them um, has been made for Robert T. Waugh that I've shown to students. Each one is about five minutes. Um, and it kind of brings this citation to life as well. Um, it's really pretty incredible what, what he did. And if you get a chance to travel to um, where these military campaigns happened, like in Normandy, Utah Beach, um, you get a chance to see uh, some of the memorials that are there, but also uh, make a connection to just exactly uh, how difficult it was and the kinds of things that they went through. Step five is death and burial. Um, was he killed in action? If so, where? And what were the circumstances of his death? Um, often we get this information from the IDPF and sometimes there's a medical file as well and they can sometimes have more details than we really need. Um, sharing this with the family can be tricky and this is a point maybe of caution. Um, usually we tell the family, um, we've learned the details, would you like to see the file? And um, so far they've all said yes and they can kind of read it on their own. Uh, but, you know, sometimes the details are, are more than we really need. And so when we tell the story, we focus more on the context of their death rather than the physical, um, you know, medical details. This is one of the files we received, medical file on Harvey Medor. Um, and under first diagnosis, it explains the wound that killed him. Burial is a very interesting subject. Um, as soldiers were killed in the battlefield, they were often buried in temporary cemeteries near the action. And then starting in 1947, after the war ended, the U.S. Army notified the listed next of kin for every service member killed and buried overseas, giving them the option to either have them reburied in one of the permanent cemeteries in Europe um, or sent back to the U.S. for reburial in a cemetery that the family could choose, including Arlington or other national cemeteries, or it could be a private cemetery. Whichever option they chose, all expenses were paid by the U.S. government. And so often the most interesting part of the research in those files are around the decision that was made um, as to where the silent hero would be permanently buried. As we saw with the family of Robert T. Waugh, um, they wanted him uh, to re be reburied in the U.S. That was the purpose of the father's letter, and the widow wanted him to stay where he was in, in Italy. 
The family actually, we found out, created a memorial to Robert Waugh in a family plot in Rhode Island. In addition to having him brought back to the U.S., they also wanted his records to be changed so that it would say he was from Cumberland, Rhode Island, rather than Maine. Um, this was because, according to the family, the parents had moved to Maine in 1942, but Robert Waugh um, was only with them a few days before he ended up having to report. So he technically enlisted from Maine, um, but according to them, he didn't really live in Maine. He was just staying there for a few days. Um, and really lived in Rhode Island, and so that's why they wanted the record to change. And one of the things we found was that as recently as 2005, his elderly sister wrote the U.S. government asking to have his records changed. That request was denied, and an obituary from in 2006 um, shows that that's when she passed away, and with it, it appears the, the, the quest uh, to bring him back or update his records also um, died with her. There's an unanswered question still out there. Um, again, why did the widow choose to have him buried in Italy, and why didn't she speak with the family before making that decision? Um, an, e an email inquiry to a nephew of Robert T. Waugh in 2017 um, shed some light on this. According to him, um, Waugh had married Helen on a whim while in basic training. Um, he says the marriage was not a happy one, according to the family, and that they were estranged when he disembarked for Europe. Um, the family never met Helen, and other than a few lover uh, letters, had no correspondence with her. But these are the kinds of stories that really hook student interest, as you probably can guess. Um, this is from 2005, when the sister filled out a form, and this is the letter that she wrote asking to have it officially changed. Um, again, this is from 2005, um, having his location changed from Maine to Rhode Island, and again, that request was denied. Um, if, you, if they're not buried in ABMC, you can go to findagrave.com and um, find out where they are buried in one of the national cemeteries like the Punch Bowl, for example, or Arlington. And here's a video clip from Normandy. This is uh, Normandy Cemetery where just over 9,000 Americans are buried near Omaha Beach. then continued to organize his men when he was hit by a second shell. Upon the realization that his wounds were fatal, he refused aid and encouraged them to save the other officer. He gave instructions to his platoon to finish the attack and died later. And some photos from some of the graves that I had a chance to visit. Um, the Roan American Cemetery, Epinal, Harvey Medor is buried there, and the Sicily Rome Cemetery in Italy. And you can see that Robert T. Waugh has the Medal of Honor on it. The last part is the legacy. What will be done with this story? How can we commemorate the sacrifice of this silent hero? And how can this story be shared with the community? Uh, we've used this website, sponsored by National History Day, to log and, and tell the stories that are posted there on the website. Um, you can make your own website, of course. Uh, we also had students raise money for a memorial on campus. Um, this one to Lewis Freeland Goddard is by our flagpole. And they raise money for this. Uh, we also had students um, sign their names on a photo, and in this case we presented a photo of Harvey Medor's grave to his son Bob, and uh, the students signed around the photo. Um, and actually last year um, I was inspired from the uh, last year's World War II Friends of the World War II uh, Teachers Conference to create a Rho Kappa National Social Studies Honor Society in my school um, to engage our community in social studies. And one of the things that are, we are going to do, we wanted to do it this year, but because of the pandemic we weren't able to, is to have a Memorial Day assembly um, to commemorate the purpose of Memorial Day and to tell one of these stories to our entire school um, at an assembly at school. By the way, the video clip that we saw at the beginning, my student Sydney, um, just again another point about the, the legacy, um, she actually, as part of her research, discovered that Arsenault should have received the Bronze Star, and she helped the family fill out the paperwork, and in 2017, he was awarded the Bronze Star, 
and Sydney was a junior at the University of Maine at the time when uh, Leo contacted her, and she actually drove um, on a school night from the University of Maine, three hours one way, um, to be in Rumford for the, at the VFW for the presentation of the Bronze Star. And that's a photo of her with Leo um, from that presentation. Um, so it really stayed with her, um, even though she was no longer a student um, of mine, um, just the importance of, of the, the legacy here, I think. Organizations supporting this work, National History Day, I've mentioned, uh, Albert H. Small Institute, I had a chance to travel with them, and the ABMC, of course. I also want to put a plug in for D-Day 2044, nonpartisan, nonprofit organization, and um, they are using those ABMC lessons, and um, they are asking teachers, they're looking for more teachers from around the country, and they're providing $300 grants. Um, if you I think you're interested in working with them, um, I would email, uh, the email is listed there, Charlie Birmingham, and tell him Shane sent you. Um, if you're interested in participating in the program, some of you maybe already are, um, but they're really just trying to get the word out so that by 2044, um, students will, uh, for the 100th anniversary, um, it'll be guaranteed being taught in, you know, in all schools nationwide. Some more resources that I've made reference to during the presentation. Um, and I also have uh, my email address if you have more questions after this. And I have some books listed as well. Uh, a couple of them I made reference to. Of course, there are tons of books, but these are books specifically to doing this type of work, um, thinking about the cemeteries and thinking about um, telling the stories of the silent heroes. So that is my presentation, and I'd be happy to take any questions, of course, now or later.